<laughs> Good evening, everyone. My name is Sam, and on behalf of Book Soup, I'd like to thank you all for joining us for tonight's event with Sarah Langan in conversation with Sarah Haskins here to discuss Good Neighbors, Sarah's latest novel. We'll be hosting more virtual events in the near future, and you can learn more about them on our website by following us on social media. You can sign up for our email newsletter, and you can also follow us here on Crowdcast to get notified directly. Our next event is next Tuesday, March 9th at same time, 6 p.m. Pacific with Kate Hope Day in conversation with Liberty Hardy to discuss Kate's new novel, In the Quick. And past events are also available on our YouTube channel. Tonight's event will end with a Q&A, and to submit a question, you can click the Ask a Question button at the bottom of the screen. And if you see a question on the list you'd like for our speakers to answer, please click the Like button, and we will try to answer as many questions as time will allow. Also, please support Book Soup and our author tonight by purchasing a copy of tonight's featured book, which you can do um, by clicking on the green button right below the viewer screen. It will redirect you to our website where you can finish the checkout process and it won't interrupt the viewing, so you can do that at any time. And we're also selling digital audiobooks and ebooks through Libro FM and Kobo for those interested. It is a very difficult time for independent bookstores, so if you are considering purchasing this book, if you haven't yet, please consider Book Soup. And with all that said, let me introduce our guest for this evening. Our In Conversation guest, Sarah Haskins, writes comedy for television and film. She and her writing partner, Emily Halpern, created the shows Trophy Wife and Carol's Second Act and have written for numerous others, including Blackish. She is one of the co screenwriters of the 2019 film Book Smart. She is originally from Chicago, which is relevant to this event, but is also something she feels compelled to say because people from Chicago are compelled to tell you of their Chicago origins, and Sarah is no different. <laughs> Thank you for being with us, Sarah. And tonight's featured author, Sarah Langan, a Columbia MFA graduate and three-time recipient of the Bram Stoker Award, is the author of three novels, including The Keeper. She grew up on Long Island, and she currently lives in Los Angeles with her husband and daughters. And you can find out more at sarahlangan.com. And without further ado, I'm going to turn the camera over to our guests. Thank you so much for joining us, and enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hey, everybody in internet world, thank you for coming. Uh, I was so flattered and delighted when Sarah Langan who is in in the uh, behind the wood paneling uh, if, to tell the Sarah's apart invited me to join her to talk about her fantastic book Good Neighbors. Hi, Sarah. Hi. I thank you. I'm so glad that you did this. You've I really appreciate it, and you've always been really supportive. I've been giving Sarah my work for like three years since we met. I was like, I have a screenplay I want you to look at. <laughs> so thank you. Yeah. And it was a really game, it. but it was fine. It was fine. <laughs> um, yes. Well, I think for for everyone here, some people have probably read the book. Some people probably haven't read the book. We'll try to do the the most non spoilery discussion we can because there are some wonderful twists and unveilings. But Sarah, would you give us like a little intro or a quick summary? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so. Good Neighbors is a story about strangers coming to a new place. And uh, the main family is the Wild family, and they come from a difficult background. They have childhood wounds that they're trying really hard to heal from. They have two kids. They've been saving up since they've been married. They live in East New York, and they finally get enough money to buy a piece of the American dream. And that's what they want. They want their kids to have a better life than they've had. And they want their kids to never have to deal with the problems that they had to deal with. So they buy the most rundown house on a cul-de-sac um, on Long Island in a town called Garden City, which is the town that uh, I grew up in. So there's a lot of overlap. Um, it's not the exact same thing. But anyway, so they move there and it's the near future and the neighbors are under their own duress. They're sort of, they were upper, upper middle class, now they're sort of hanging on to middle class. There's a lot more anxiety happening, specifically because of the economic effects of global warming and uh, the damage caused by it. And the most obvious symptom of that is the sinkhole warning in the middle of the park on the cul-de-sac where the kids all play. So what happens is the wilds move in and they don't fit. The dad's like a chain smoker with sleeve tattoos who used to be hooked on heroin and was a musician who can't make it anymore as a musician. And the mom was a beauty pageant winner 
who dresses in really tight outfits and like just does not pass suburban mom muster. And it looks like they're going to fail uh, until the next door neighbor, Rhea Schroeder, takes an interest in them. And Rhea is having her own struggles in her life in that she also feels like she's been faking this perfect life since she's been on Maple Street. And what she sees in Gertie is someone that she can talk to about it and actually have a real friendship with. And so she approaches Gertie and she's the queen bee and she's the boss and uh, makes the rest of the neighbors accept Gertie. But then there's a misunderstanding between them. And both of them feel like that the other has touched on wounds and is attacking them. And Rhea spreads some horrible, horrible rumors about the entire Wild family, which everyone on the block believes, or half of them do. And at the same time, this sinkhole finally opens, and one of the kids in the neighborhood falls down the sinkhole. And what happens is the Wilds become a scapegoat for that missing child. And so the book is a lot about mob mentality and uh, the ways that our past affect the way we now handle conflict as adults. And um, just to jump right to it, the former beauty pageant character was obviously based on me, your your friend. Former. It was. Yeah, it thank, was. Thank you for acknowledging that. No. Yeah. Um, it's like you you wear a lot of tube tops. I wear a lot of tube tops. And you, you showed up at the soccer games that way. A turtleneck is like a neck tube top. So. <laughs> Um, no, and in that overview, which I think is is succinct and all, and like touches on so many of the wonderful aspects of this book, like, but it so Good Neighbors has so many themes, right? Like socioeconomic class, motherhood, mass hysteria, narcissism, trauma, environmental disaster. I want to talk about all of them and the way they appear in the book. But was there one that kicked off the story in your head? Like when you started thinking about this, did you come from a place of character or? Did the character come with this idea? Like, what was the germ? I think it was, uh, the revelation for me was trauma. And it was, you know, you get to middle age and you start to evaluate your own character, or at least I did. And I was like, I notice that I'm oversensitive to things that I shouldn't be oversensitive to. And I started to realize I'd read some of Megan Abbott's novels and I love her work because it's so much about the psychology of the way that women interact and they kind of sometimes destroy each other over things they're fighting ghosts like so that so they fight each other but they're really fighting some incident that happened in their past and so as i was growing up as a person in trying to change and be a better parent and a better human being i kind of was seeing the ways that i did that and it was really horrifying i you know i think I think that's why this story, so many people are crying when they read it. And it's not, it's not scary, you know, it's just the realization that like, we all are like this. It's the way that the human brain works, where we store fear and we store events that have happened in our lives and we see patterns where they don't exist. So um, it's so much about, for me, that was the germ of it. Uh, was was breaking down the ways that people see false patterns and the ways that that is so damaging. Was it uh, people more or women and moms? Well, so I think I focused on the moms um, because uh, I was also, you know, you become a mother and suddenly your identity is something completely different. And these expectations on you are so high. And by you, I mean me, you know, that's, I don't know if it's universal, but I think mostly, most moms that I talk to, it's a shock. Um, and you want to do a perfect job and you want to, your kid is the most important thing to you in the world, but it's impossible. And there's so much judgment. And I really wanted to give a voice to the rage that I felt, um, being saddled with this identity that I didn't know how to handle, that I couldn't break out of, and that I think is pretty universal to this mom archetype where, you know, we have to be perfect. And if we're not, 
we're censured for it, but we don't know how to be perfect. And we can't ask for advice except like Dr. Sears, who's like a garbage misogynist. So he, I mean, like you read his stuff and he says things like, well, you probably don't deserve to be a mom if you're not willing to quit your job and, and you're not willing, at least if you have to work, you need to have a picture of your baby on your desk and then you need to pump you know, while looking at your baby, because that'll make the milk run because you love your baby so much. And I remember reading this and being like, I don't think that I'm this person. And like, this is the only book that everyone says you're supposed to read. Um, but I think there's, it's more universal than that. I think, um, I think that it's just because mothers are responsible for the next generation, our very existence is kind of triggering for people. And they sort of bring their childhoods to our feet. And it's like, you you have to be better than this. You can't do this. And strangers are allowed to approach us. You know, other moms who are older and furious that, you know, we might be taking more liberties than they got. And random people on the street. Um, you know, I think, I think we're just subject to an absurd amount of criticism. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and there's a lot of vulnerability. And I mean, Gertie and Rhea have some really difficult parenting moments in their past, and they have very difficult, let's say, flaws. Let's put a nice word on it, flaws. <laughs> um, and is that, so coming from this mom place where like you see societally, like the box we can be put in, is it is it hard to write that as a mom? Like, you know, I go to work and I get to do like silly, dumb stuff, but you're really probing some dark aspects of people's psyche related to parenthood. And we talked about one scene in the novel when, when Gertie drives away from a conflict that her daughter is involved in that, you know, you said was both real and painful to, to think about the character being so unlikable in that moment. I, you know, that was probably the hardest uh, thing to write. Um, I'll back up and say like, when I sit down and I get in the zone, I don't think about it. Okay. You know, I just I just get as true as I can. But backing away from that a few steps, I forget, you know, people are like, I like it. And I'm like, great, it must be a good book. Here you go. Like, <laughs> people should read it. And then I forget that people might get upset. People might think, like, maybe she's like this with her kids. Maybe, oh. you know, there's something. And I that's my worry. It's not I don't really care if they think I'm a jerk or, you know, I'm not entitled to these emotions. Like I get I wrote an or essay on Lit Hub and like the amount of people who are like, she's whiny. And it was like, all right, good for you. Um, you spent some time on that. But but that's fine. Uh, I don't. It frightens me that people might judge my children or or, uh, you know, not want their kids to play with my kids because I write horror. Um, that, that makes me nervous. Um, that they, that they mistake it for, for who I am. But anyway, the thing with Gertie, uh, I'll just briefly explain that Gertie Wilde is the, the mom and she is unable to handle conflict because of her childhood. She was sort of rented out by her stepmother in the worst imaginable ways. And the way that she's recovered from that or tried to is she reads tons of self-help, but she also, um, she just shuts down when there's any kind of conflict because she's just like, I don't know. I just don't know what's happening and I'm just gonna hide from this and pretend it's not happening. So she forces her daughter and son to go play with the neighborhood kids after all the rumors have started. And then she goes outside to go to her job. She's got to go show a house. And uh, she sees that the kids are being ridiculed, her kids, loudly, in a way that she should confront. As a reader, you clearly know this. Um, but she doesn't. She just, she's like, I should do something. I don't know what to do. I have no idea what to do. And then she drives off. And, you know, I've had a lot of readers turn off and say, I don't like her as a result of that. And I'm really surprised, I get it, but I, I also think it's the most true moment in the book because we all fail the people we love all the time. And like, that's just inevitable. Um, the hope is that 
we can redress it in some way and think about it because we all have triggers. There's, you know, we're just human. That's how we work. We all have blind spots. Um, but it was the hardest I, that came to me at like the fourth draft because that she was too good. And I was like, mm. Oh, she would do this. This is a true thing she would do. And I yeah. like, it looked like a, a gin and tonic you were having just now. And I got, I got jealous. <laughs> <laughs> it's water and lime, but it looks very complicated. Um, I wish it was, a, the, we all should, everyone pause, go make a quick G&T, come back. We'll be the people of Garden City, Long Island. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it's funny, I didn't judge Gertie in that moment because there's also, like before there's the parent mom mentality in the book, there's a bit of a kid mom mentality that you're exploring. And I think it read as really real. And there is sort of a world where it's like, oh, stepping in there is maybe exposing my kids to further you ridicule. Know, ridicule. No, I know. Yeah. You, like you just don't in. know. Yeah. Um, and I've seen every parent reaction in real life to that same thing where they run in and they start screaming at the other kids to like, you know, the genius who knows exactly what to do to me, who I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea what to do to help you. But that's so like the context that the wilds move into is this suburb of strivers, right? Like you said, middle to upper middle class strivers who are part of the raising a perfect child cultural obsession that we have right now, right? Like the being the perfect parent, having the perfect progeny. You've lived on both coasts. Like, is there a difference? Is this a countrywide issue? Are there specific things you wrote for New York versus what you see here in your real parent life? I love that question. I, I would say that, so I grew up in, a, in the suburbs and it was very, uh, it was good in its way. The schools were good. I was always safe. I knew kids from when I was born till like I still know them and I'm in touch with them. But it was extremely stifling and you had to be a certain way. And everybody knew whose parent did what for a living. And it was very much like Maple Street. Um, then I lived in Brooklyn and it was Crown Heights and it was so different. And like my kids at school, like I just didn't have time to brush Clem's hair all the time. And she had this like thing, you know? <laughs> Like, and I would bring them to school and it was fine. And they'd be in pajamas. And I was like, ah, I just, I'm trying my best. I'm very tired. And uh, it was super relaxed. And we walked down the street and like people just knew us in Crown Heights and we knew them. And it was such a neighborhood. And it was so non judgmental because um, it was so heterogeneous. Like everyone was coming from some different place. Like people weren't mostly from the same country. And it was, we just didn't have any basis of comparison. And then when we moved to Laurel Canyon, I felt that it was back to a little bit more judgmental. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there were expectations on what we're supposed to look like. I think that's an LA thing. Um, you know, I, I used to walk around, like I'm not, I'm not a fashion plate now, but like in Brooklyn, like I remember a neighbor being like, you look insane and homeless and like an imitation of Dave or Foster Wallace. And that's what I'm going to call you. Cause I had like, Ugh! you know, like I was like, I just had to get some coffee. I'm going to, you know, that was fine. I, that wouldn't fly here. Um, and I think the way that kids are raised is different here. And in some ways it's better because uh, it's more mainstream. And I liked that about it. Um, you know, I think, I think Brooklyn can be a little tough to fit in with, to know how every, the rest of the country works. It's probably a huge shock for them. And it's good to have different um, perspectives. Uh, but yeah, I would say that, and the rest, I don't know, you know, I mean, you're from Chicago. Yes, I've, I've mentioned that. Um, no, and I was, so fitting in is such a major theme. To me, it really is a class issue in the book. Can I read a paragraph from one of the first pages? Yeah. Right. Is it weird to hear another person read your writing? No, I love it. I love okay. it. I'm like 50 50 on my own voice. So, all right. So, this is from the book begins actually, for those of you guys who haven't read it, like there's an awesome framing device, you know, of a few of books that have been written about, like there's an intertextual thing going on of books that have been written about the events of good neighbors. And then we jump into, you know, this, the narrative itself. But um, so the paragraph is, and this is right from the beginning, so no spoilers. Uh, the inside of 116 Maple Street was haphazard too. 
As a kid, you might have visited this sort of home on a play date and intuited the mess as happy, but also chaotic. You had a great time when you slept over. You never had to worry about the stuff you had to bother with at home, making your bed, hanging your wet towel, carrying your dishes to the sink. Still, you wanted to go home pretty soon after, because even with the laughter, all that mess started to make you nervous. You got the feeling that the management was in over its head. Like, I was into that book when I read that paragraph. Because, <laughs> first of all, I mean, like, I'm slightly afraid to be your friend with your powers of observation. But um, <laughs> that's such a real feeling. Like, I had that as a kid when you go into someone else's house and, like, you can read them. And, like, so that's another awesome thing about this book is the houses are very interesting spaces when seen through the eyes of the kids coming into them. They had smells, too. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. I remember, like, some smells I liked and some smells I was like, I don't think they have a good diet. <laughs> you could smell just whatever that was. Yeah. No, in yeah. Chicago, I grew up on a street that was like a pretty community street. Like we all knew our neighbors and a bunch of us were in townhouses on one side of the street. And then there were like smaller versions of the townhouse on the other. And we were all gentrifiers. Like my, my parents of, of this neighborhood in Chicago were like, was yuppies moving into a former very blue collar neighborhood. But I remember there was a family that moved in and they were like different because more they were like sterner and they had like more rules and more expectations and it, it th like the kids, the kids read the room as well as the adults. And that happens in this book too. Oh yeah. When you go to somebody's house where they had too many rules, I remember going to a play date with one kid and I wouldn't do it again because her mom was like, here's your snack. And it was a half a glass of milk and like a cookie. And I was like, what is this? Like, this is crazy. I can't, <laughs> I can't live like this. And then she was like, why don't you do your homework? And I was like, I don't do my homework on play dates. If I do it, like <laughs> I'm just gonna sit quietly. This is the worst thing that's ever happened to me. But yeah, I mean, everybody has their own rules and expectations. And I think, you know, as a kid, you know what's going on, but you don't have to actually deal with it. You can just make fun of the other kid or, you know, not in a mean way, but be like, no, I'm not going, you're coming to my house where the snacks are good. Right. But as an adult, uh, the work of the primary caregiver, most often the mom in that situation is now you have to navigate this crap. Like you have to come in and figure out like, is this okay for my kids to be in? Or what are the rules that I like? And what are the rules that I don't like? And, and now I have to get along with this other mom and I have to not trigger her when there's an expectation I have that's not being met. And it's like this unspoken thing that's, that's, a lot of the work of parenting that I think is ridiculed in, in television and media as, as superficial, as just a means of attacking other women. When no, it's the job. It's the job. You have to be like, what are you doing? What's happening in the house? You know, I want to get along. I want this all to work well. So now I have to, or, or somebody has to approach me and then I have to say, yes, I'll do what you'd like. I will always honor that. I don't see, perceive that as you attacking my parenting. I don't perceive that as whatever, even though, and it's very hard. I mean, I think at a, at a regular job, you know, you have human resources to take care of this. You don't have to go up to somebody and be like, you know, you've got to stop doing this or I don't like this. But it's, it's this unspoken job um, that is so much about um, stepping on each other's landmines. Um, I mean, it's, it's almost impossible. You know, you have to have really thick skin and there's always going to be trouble. Yeah, well, and that was the suspense of the novel for me, because like, you know, we talked about what, how would you categorize this novel? And I know psychological thriller is a way people are talking about it, but the suspense for me was I guess in just maybe it's as a mom or as someone who's trying to fit their kids into neighborhoods, like was the suspense of those stakes. And as everything started to fall apart, I got more and more anxious about what the outcome was. So my question for you is kind of like, well, it's, I'm going to also delve into your background for a second, but like, how would you describe this novel in a genre? Because I don't think it fit neat, fits neatly into these. I don't, you know, I don't think my work ever has fit, hmm. you know, into a genre. Um, 
I was thinking about this and I was thinking about, uh, I feel kind of bad about saying this isn't a horror novel because I feel like I'm turning my back on horror, which are my roots and which have really supported me and I love and that I've worked in that field. But what I want to say is that um, when I was younger, what I thought was worth talking about was not women's stories. What I thought, and I was raised to believe, was that things had to be bigger, that um, that the story of the domestic was not as significant as this canon of 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 male dominated work mostly in horror and even as they write you know there is a there is a large genre of horror that's suburban it's typically written by men and it's their impressions of what that is and i and i think they have often very flawed impressions because they are not at least that generation was not at home that much you know so as i as I grew, um, I feel like the people I want to be speaking to are people like me, and it's women, and it's mothers. And so it's horror, but it's my horror. And I don't <laughs> think- I love that. <laughs> no, that's wonderful. <laughs> All right, I totally interrupted you because I love that. Well, yeah, I mean, and I think, but if I said that, uh, the other thing is in a marketing way, like Atria rebranded me because when women hear it's horror, they don't want to read it. Um, and book clubs don't pick horror books because they're sensitive people in their group who don't want to read it. But for whatever reason, Good Neighbors is doing fine in those categories. Just don't call it horror. Mm hmm. Well, because also, like, I, I guess horror, you think monster or supernatural or and you have like frightening things that happen in this, but it's not a rabid dog. It's not a vampire. It's not a haunting in the literal ghost walking around sense, like because there's the horror of the things that happen or the things you're anticipating, the suspense you set up. But I think some of the scariest stuff is when you read flaws about people and you think what I'm so afraid I'd go there someday. I'm so afraid I could be this bad a person. I'm so afraid I could be this mother. Like I'm so afraid of my own, like that's, that's some scary stuff in here, which is well, cool. I, you know, I'm, I'm so sympathetic to Rhea who is, who is the, you know, I think we know at least by halfway through that she's the anti-hero. If, if not the villain. Yes, but I was very sympathetic with her through a lot, even as I was like, oh, she's becoming more unreliable, let's say, to not, you know. Well, I think she was alone. You know, I think she did this job raising four kids and she did it really well and she had no help and she was supposed to wear this mask and she was supposed to be this archetype. And I think it made her more sick. You know, she yeah. had a problem and then this exacerbated the problem and it trapped her. And I think when she reaches out to Gertie, she knows something's wrong and she wants to be better. I mean, it's it's the, re the reason she reaches out is her love for her child. I mean, that's why you change is is that's why any of us change. We wouldn't change like it sucks to change and it feels bad. And you, you know. <laughs> but like the reason we do it is so that we can be better people for the people we love, you know. And so that's why she's looking, you know, she wants to be this and there's no option for her. I mean, obviously, you know, as a healthy individual could say, well, they could do this and they could go call a psychiatrist and they could do this. But uh, her shame in who she is, I think, is specifically because she's a woman. Mm -hmm. She's not entitled to these emotions. She's in, not entitled. No, she's she's really trapped by that suburban standards and by her past with the suburban standards. I felt like I don't um, to to pull out a little bit, you know, just so we're not stuck in um, for in the audience of people who've read the novel. Looking at my crazy, I cut my own bangs, you guys. <laughs> we had a rousing conversation about haircuts and allergies. I'm sorry, you guys missed the green room conversation. Yeah. 
I think they look great. Do you want to tell us about where you are right now? Tell us about where you are. What this oh, is yeah. your, this is your writing yeah. space. Like So this is my writing space. It did not have all this glitter behind it. These beautiful posters that need frames. That's um so if I have my finger right. Okay, that's Monsters of Maple Street. Monsters of do on Maple Street, which was part of the inspiration of the Twilight's ep episode. The one in red is Suspiria. Then the next one is Dogville. And then this one is like fan art of the Capitol. It's come to the Capitol from um, Hunger Games, which mm -hmm. I love. And then there's some by Bram Stoker words. And then it's a garage. So. <laughs> <laughs> And how would you say that this space you're in reflects the way women are put in spaces <laughs> in our culture? Mothers who write novels. Yeah. And JT's like, I have to write at the dining room table, you people. <laughs> That's my husband. Like we're, he's, sometimes I feel, I just want to say that I have these feelings, but sometimes I feel, uh, and I, and they're, they're important to say, but my husband is really supportive um, and and does a lot of the heavy lifting. And uh, that's important to s say for once on the last. <laughs> it's being recorded. So just play it on yes. Father's Day and you're yes. done. Yeah. Um, so when you're when you're putting together this, you know, you're you're bringing together all these characters, like I said, these wonderful sort of framing devices that kind of reminded me of The Handmaid's Tale, actually situating us in this alternate future with this sort of scholarly tone. Um, but uh, where, so is it fun? Like, are you having fun as things get more and more intense on Maple yeah. Street? Okay. As, as a writer, am I? Yeah. 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 No, as soon as, as soon as it all starts to come together, that's really fun. And I love that when you get to decide exactly what happens in the end, you know, cause you build it all together. I'm sure you have the same thing. And then when you're at the end, you're like, I had all these doors open for how this might play out. And now I get to really feel the most right one. So did you not know as you approached those final pages, how you were going to end it? I knew what you know from the beginning, from the prologue, right. which is a family is murdered in cold blood. Yes. Um, but I was like, I don't know how I'm going to play this. Um, and then, and then I, you know, the more I, I, then I knew which family, but then okay. I was like, am I really going to do that? And <laughs> so, yeah. Wow. That's cool. Um, so there's a, there's a comment here. We're not moving fully into questions. Everyone don't get too excited, but I'm um, mentioning the twilight zone episode that you have oh, yeah. you. and it says, I love the way good neighbors draws on its mythos. And I know that that was an inspiration for you, the twilight zone. Do you want to share a little bit? Yeah. About, yeah. Hi, Ben. He's from my writing group in Brooklyn. Oh, awesome. Ben. Um, so, so uh, the monsters are due on Maple street is this uh, episode of the twilight zone that had a big impression for me because it's one of the only ones that Sterling plays straight and he breaks, you know, he always breaks the third wall at the end. But in this episode at the end, he says, well, I'll give you the brief synopsis, which is that it's a cul-de-sac, uh, the lights and power all goes out and everyone comes outside and they're like, what happened? What happened? And this one kid in the group says, well, I read science fiction and what it is, is it's aliens who are going to take over, but they've already come and they came ahead of time. And it's usually a couple and they're among us now. And everyone's like, this kid, he's crazy. But then, you know, it's, it's about McCarthyism, but then a car turns on and then a light turns on in a different house. And the mob starts running around going, well, who's responsible for this? Well, how is this happening? And it ends with somebody being murdered. And then you pull out and you've, of course, got these two aliens who look like humans who say, this is how you destroy mankind. It's so easy. And every town has a Maple Street and you go from one to the next and you make them kill each other. It's so easy. And then Sterling comes on and he's like, this is not confined to the Twilight Zone. And it affects the tragedy is it affects our children and our children's children. And it's like. Oh, because everything else, he's like, it's a made up. It's kind of fun. And he's like, this isn't made up. 
this is real. And um, yeah, so that was a lot of fun. But then, so I researched that and then I thought, well, people are like that. And, and we were all taught that people are like that uh, in college and growing up, like people are really easy to manipulate and they can be inherently mean. And we're all, you know, we've all got to read Andersonville when we're in high school and we've all got to come to this conclusion about humanity. And then in college, you know, I, I took sociology and Kitty Genovese and the Stanford prison experiments. So then I went back and researched these things and they're all false. Um, well, Anderson's not, well, it's not false, but I mean, Kitty Gen uh, so Kitty Genovese didn't die alone. Uh, that was the, uh, the myth that we were all taught as true. In fact, uh, it was a cover up. The New York City Police Department didn't want people to know. They've been called and just hadn't shown up. So they said they never got any calls. In fact, many of the neighbors called. And then Kitty was dragged behind something. They didn't know she was still there. When they found out, they ran out again. One of the neighbors held her, held Kitty in her arms as she died. He was not alone. And then the Stanford prison experiments are like, this is too upsetting for you to know. And I remember being like, I think I can't be a sociology major because it's, I don't want to live in this space. It's too awful. The prison experiment was uh, this guy at Stanford had his class have some people be prison wardens and some people be inmates. And you watch on footage and it gets more and more sadistic and they break down. But go read about it now and it's like debunked. Um, he told them what he wanted to do and they did it for the grades and because the, he was their teacher and they were eager to please because they were nice kids and they knew it wasn't real and nobody had a nervous breakdown. And it was... So, so these myths about who we are, these narratives about us as a species are actually, I think, false. But we have them, just like we have these triggering things in our childhoods or whatever that are also false. And I think these narratives, uh, the characters in my book, I'm trying to make the statement, who kind of push aside what everyone's told them about what life is and just decide to try to be kind, to be generous, to not make those assumptions are rewarded. Mm -hmm. well, I, yeah. Well, and I, <laughs> I'm trying to think about like a question that isn't spoiler free <laughs> beyond that. But um, yeah, I think it's interesting that the difference between the adults and the children, how they react to the events on Maple Street. But I love the idea of uh, this is also an examination of sort of the modern McCarthyism of like mother judging <laughs> in terms of, you know, a way something can easily drive a community together or apart. Well, I, I was like, so one time I was at the Brooklyn Museum with my older daughter and they had sprinklers, right? You know, they had this waterworks and it was really hot and the kids used to go in in the sprinklers in front of the museum, or no, the public library, maybe that was it. And uh, some boys were in it with swim trunks and she hadn't brought her suit that day. She'd forgotten and we were leaving and she said, could I just go in? I'll just take off my shirt and go in my, with my shorts. And the security guard came and said, you're abusing that child. I'm gonna call child services on you. And uh, because you can't allow your, I think she was two, to be exposed in that way. And I was like, please don't do this. Please just let us go. And she was like, no, I'm sorry, I can't allow this. As another human, you know, as another, you know, human who's invested in what you do and having a right to do that, I'm gonna call the police. And there's so many stories like that. It's endless um, of what you have to put up with as a parent. And uh, it's frightening. And it's, it really is the last legitimized sexism, hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. um, that and working in the office of the governor of New York, maybe. Um, so there, um, there are, so we have, yeah. these human, we have these human catastrophes in the book. And then there's also this overriding environmental catastrophe. And I don't know if people know this, but you have a master's degree in environmental science. And... Talk to me about how your scientific background informs your writing or 
a more exciting way of saying this is what scares you right now? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so climate change, uh, you know, is the same as global warming. Um, I, I like global warming better because it's more alarming, but I think climate change uh, is what I'm worried about. And that means just more, more of everything. So like, you know, the more heat in a system, the more breeding ground for disease. Oh, well, Sarah, you have gone a little Zoom freezy or have I gone Zoom freezy? Chat, will you let us know? Chat, did I freeze? Langen froze. Okay, Sarah, you're frozen. Oh, I can't hear her. Hmm. Okay, Sarah, refresh your page. I'll refresh my page too. Let's all refresh our pages, guys. It's a page refresh. Sarah's coming back on. I don't know if you guys can hear me, but it's 641. So in a few minutes, we'll probably open up for some questions. So please, if you have them, start throwing them into the chat um, or into the ask a question box rather than the chat. Yeah. Um, anyway, this is a great book and you should definitely buy it from Book Soup. We'll follow that but I can also vamp in other exciting ways. Um, oh, wait. Okay, wait. I'm so ah! sorry. Can you hear me? <laughs> I, was, I was about to just talk. Maybe I was about to no, I was watching you the whole time and you were doing great ad libbing and I was like, hello, it's probably Sarah Haskins you can't hear, right? <laughs> you can hear me, right? <laughs> yeah, of course, like the person, the important person is frozen. Um, again, we switch sides now, Ben Francisco pointed out. Um, yeah. It's like a crazy episode of Crossfire. Like, what? Oh, so quick answer to the what scares me is I just yeah. think, you know, Americans are lucky. Uh, the kind of the, the effects of climate change won't be as bad for us. But how we treat people who need help, who need to come to this country, uh, how we prepare for that, um, if we prepare for that, that's really important. But I also, I know that there are a lot of screenwriting students here. So I thought mm -hmm. they might want to ask some questions about screenwriting that we yes. had. Yes. And before they do that, actually, two things. Um, is there a future for good neighbors on the screen? There hopefully is. Um, so it's, it's, I can't say the name of the producer, but They've been really good. They're working with me and there's, I wrote a pilot and uh, it's um, hopefully there'll be good news. And there's even someone really cool attached to it. Oh. So, so yes, that it's I told you about already. <laughs> I'm pretending I didn't know. Didn't I do a good job? I know, I liked it. Yeah, I was like, oh. <laughs> um, and yeah, it would, it would be a series. It wouldn't be a movie. I don't think they're making movies for a little while. Okay. Um, so, and then what is, what are you reading right now? Like what gets you into something? Oh, you know, I brought a whole bunch. So, oh, so I was inspired a lot by Carrie because it has those articles in them. I love The Handmaid's Tale. I just, this, these are the books that I have that made the move. Winter's Bone, it's so good. Um, I really love Lauren Groff. I like Station Eleven. Oh. I like, love right? Station Oh, love it. That's going to be a TV show, right? Oh, I don't, I don't know. know. I don't know. Dan Shun, Ill Will. This is a really good book. Uh, okay. Walter Tevis, if you've liked The Queen's Gambit, you should read Mockingbird because it's his best one. Mm -hmm. um, Gillian Flynn, Spectacular. And then the book I really like this year that was horror is uh, Grady Hendrix's book. Um, no, I've seen, I've seen that just because it's such a great cover. It's, it's really good. Um, 
He gets into uh, the 1980s housewives mind uh, really well and talks about the stif how stifling it was for them in ways that made me cry. And I, I asked him, I was like, how did you, I'm kind of pissed that you wrote this, you know, like, how did you come up with it? And he was like, he read The Feminine Mystique, his mom lent him a copy and was like, he was all in, which makes sense. It's like, this was not an accidental. Oh, they said they had an event for that book. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I would say for the people interested in reading this, I did not approach Good Good Neighbors series as a, uh, I thought like in horror, it was more the horror of Shirley Jackson, really, in a sense, which is like the horror of our own human selves. And then I love the framing, which, like I said, and, and the slight futurism and the recognition of environmental catastrophe, like that all rang at what to me. So I think that this is a novel that is, you know, hard to situate because it's so it's so deeply real and traumatic. And it has like moments where it, it gets a little it pushes those boundaries. But for for people buying this book, I wouldn't it doesn't fit neatly into that genre. And they're not marketing it that way, totally. So, it's just, um, it's just good. Yes. Okay. There are some questions in the chat, so let's let's hit them. Uh, okay. okay. You mentioned writing Gertie's scene of failing Julia in the fourth draft. Can you talk about how your books in general, or this book in particular, changed from draft to draft? What's the first draft like for you? So, uh, with this one, it took me a really long time to write because it started out as a horror novel. Um, that was the path that I knew and then I couldn't write it. And it was because the monster was competing with the human story and the human story I liked better, but I didn't know how to tell. I was like, won't that be boring? Like, <laughs> like <laughs> does anyone want to read a story about ladies? So yes. And, uh, so, but I also had to change uh, as a, as a person. So anyway, I went back to it uh, and I'd written about 200 pages that I'd revised several times and I just rewrote the whole thing and did it without a monster. And uh, that felt good. And then I have an agent, Stacia Decker, who has worked with me more than like anyone has ever worked with me. Um, so we went through, I don't know, three or four drafts. And she has this, I think we're a really good match because I am not practical. I write about emotions and like feelings. And then this thing happened and she'll be like, that didn't just happen. I can't write that. <laughs> and <laughs> so she would give me like 10 pages of notes every time and then line edit it. You know, she, she's amazing. Um, so I have to, I have to say that that's been a real part of my process too, is working with her. Um, and so, but, but for a more, you know, you're not looking for that. You're looking for me to say like, what do you do from draft to draft? And I think uh, it's good to print them up. It's good to read them completely through. And then it's good to just try and imagine yourself as a, a random reader and think like, you know, what's interesting here? What's not interesting? What do I believe? And what do I not believe? And the shortcuts that you want to take, which are like, this is close enough. This gets to the plot. This is where it needs to go are the ones you need to just stop taking and go, okay, no, that's not good enough. It's never, it's a leap of faith should never be expected. Hmm. All right. Thank and the next, uh, the next question is you mentioned how monsters on Maple street was very much about McCarthyism. I know, I think you started conceiving good neighbors pre 2016, but I'm curious if all the scapegoating of the Trump era affected you during the writing process. I think, uh, yeah, I mean, so when I was really doing the meat of this book, I was trying to understand what was happening in the world and why people were so easily, more easily radicalized than they ever have been. And, you know, my, I came up with uh, somewhat that it's, it's a heightened pressure and uh, a confusion about what we have control over and what we don't and our role in social media. And I think it's really Twitter and Facebook have really sold us the lie that if we talk about things enough and are angry enough um, that we're making something better when we're making it worse. 
Um, and I think it's really harnessed our best instincts in that way. Um, and I also think that that's the logical progression of where we're headed. I, I rewatched this movie, or I watched this movie, Face in the Crowd, the Alaya Kazan uh, with my husband. And it sort of predicts this, and it predicts a bad player coming out and, and taking advantage and telling people what they want to hear and dividing people. And so I think, you know, this, this was happening before media, but it's gotten worse. And, uh, and I think, yeah, the book, I think that Storming the Capital was the logical pro progression of, of what's been going on. Yeah. Um, the next question is, what did you find different slash difficult in writing a novel and writing a script? There's completely different animals. I thought it would not be that hard. I was like, you know, it's uh, it's really hard. It's just a completely different muscle. But it's like it's shorter, right? And you don't have to write about characters. But uh, so a novel to me is like you take a giant tree stump and you're like a woodpecker or something, and you're just chewing the tree <laughs> until it's pulp. And it's just like you just don't stop. You just keep working. Whereas a screenplay is like you know a giant Rubik's cube with many many more pieces. And somebody's like here, <laughs> and you're like. Oh my God, you know, it's like, it's completely different. And so uh, a screenplay is also more like a haiku in that there's just certain things you have to hit. And there's different kinds of writing, right? There's, there's, there's the there's screenplay and then there's television. And television, you have to write the pilot, but the pilot has to anticipate an entire season and series. So... And you can't just write it. Like, I thought I could just write a pilot and then you figure out, don't worry about it. And it's like, it doesn't work that way. You actually have to know the whole thing. I think but it's I, with something as complicated as this story-wise. I mean, it was something as rich as this. Like, the book has an arc. Yeah. Like, yeah. You, unless you were going to chew it all up in the pilot, you, you really do have to decide, okay, over, you know, X amount of episodes, how is this plot going to be unstrung? Yeah, but I think even with any, if it were spec, you have to know like what are, oh yeah, what are the arcs of everyone? How mm. many episodes is this going to be? What's every little point? I mean, you know this way better than I do, so you should probably speak to that. Well, the good thing is in comedy, sometimes you don't have to know, and you just say things when you're selling it. Like they'll learn to love their family, and then like you're saying, oh, it's funny. <laughs> you're not really going to learn to love their family because then it won't be funny. Like you promise, <laughs> you promise this moral development on the part of the character, and then. You can't actually ever achieve that on the character, and it has to end with That's a sitcom. Really with other stuff, with a sitcom, it's you have to you're playing the same situation for a comedy over and over and over. So like you can you can get a little closer, but it's what is that Occam's razor? You can only go like half of the way. Yeah, yeah. that makes sense. Like Rick and yeah. Morty, where I'm like they're never going to change. No, you can't. <laughs> <It's pretty fun. laughs> yeah. You're, you're always kind of the same. Um, but you know, the office they did just as like a, I remember in the office, everyone has this really long arc. Yes. And I want, yes, that is true. And I, I think you can, you can move people along the arc and you can certainly move plots along the arc too. Right. And let them emotionally develop and do exciting things. But at their core, the funny is they keep Michael Scott's not changing. Um, right the main character of the office. Uh, so as we wait for any more questions from peeps, um, and I know there's a screenwriting class out here, so please do, you know, hop in. But what what is the next thing you're thinking of exploring for after everyone buys hundreds of millions of copies of Good Neighbors? And you're like, am I too rich to write? Like, what will you yeah. do next? Um, so I, I uh, Simon & Schuster has a partial of my next book. Um, and I'm super excited about it. Uh, it's it's uh, it's a little more near future. A little it's a it's about a company town, like mm -hmm. like a Microsoft or, uh, you know, like a like a giant Google town, and what happens in there and what the top one percent looks like. In within the company town. Yeah, yeah, it's closed off. It's sort of this, you know. It, it's a little bit um, orcs and crake, but 
I, mm -hmm. it's, that Atwood where, where it's like, but before the flood, before the disaster, where things are coming apart. Yeah, it's hard not to feel that way. Um, how did you, another question, how did you find your agent originally? Did it take a long time before you sold your first novel? Yeah, so uh, originally I found, uh, I was a, I joined the Horror Writers Association and I was in New York and they had a bar night and uh, a film agent named Sarah South came and she uh, requested my manuscript and I had it, it was ready. It was called The Keeper. And that book, I was, I was just turned 30 and I had been writing that since I was 21. So that was a long time. And uh, I'd been looking and got, I'd gotten, been rejected from every agent in town, sometimes twice. Uh, you know, sometimes you have something that nobody wants because it's just not, horror wasn't selling at that time. Nobody wanted to look at it. So there was that. Um, anyway, Sarah found me, the lit agent, who sold my first three books. And it took a long time. It was really hard. And then, you know, I sort of had to make a shift. It had been a long time since I'd written a book and find a new agent. And finding Stacia was hard. You know, I had to, um, I'm so glad she took me. Uh, she didn't know she wanted to. And I was like, what if I came to your office? Like I was a crazy person. And I was like, could I just visit you and introduce myself? <laughs> she was like, oh God. Yeah. Okay. So I did, you know, and I wanted to know I wasn't crazy, but also that I really wanted to work with her because I think um, it's really important to find the right person for you. And it's inevitable that the first few people will be wrong unless you're wildly, wildly lucky in the first few situations. But whatever you do have control over is like, if you get a good sense about somebody, if you think they're the right match, if you think you have the same um, compass about what an artistic career should look like, uh, those are really important things. And you shouldn't just say like, oh, but they're an agent and they want me because it's never gonna work ever. Yeah, that has to be scary to switch agents too after three books. That was awful. Yeah, it was so bad. Yeah. Um, the next question is: Could you talk about the mental health research you did to explain expand your character knowledge for Good Neighbors? Yeah, yeah. So I um, I did a deep dive. I was listening to this podcast called Psychology in Seattle, mm -hmm. um, and behind the paywall are really, really good deep dives on um, personality. They don't call them personality disorders anymore, but that's what they were calling them when I was looking into it. Like narcissism, attachment theory. Uh, so, so I did a lot of work on that and I was trying to find a character, like I couldn't figure out who would be the leader of my mob that I would also like and have empathy for and who might have be charismatic because a, a mob leader has to be charismatic. And so when I was researching, I went through it, like I was like passive aggressive disorder is amazing and it's so fascinating and it, it does explain so much. You know, uh, I think a lot of pop psych or a lot of psychology sort of is trendy, um, but this, it just fits so neatly into explaining people's behaviors that it was really shocking to me. It was like a revelation. So when I stumbled across narcissism, I realized that was the one because narcissists, um, uh -oh. they're, they're so like, they've been injured so badly that their coping mechanism is to pretend to everyone that they're perfect, but they know they're not. And they feel empty all the time. And they're always in pain and they're magical thinkers and they both think they're more special than everyone else and not at all special. And they're terrified people will find out their secret, the real them, you know, which is obvious to anyone looking, but they don't know, know that. They, they're so covered in these different guises. They have no idea. Um, and they're the only people who are sane who will kill in order to defend their defense mechanisms and to keep people from finding out who they are. So, you know, those, those people who um, commit murder in order for someone, even of, of family members, uh, in order to keep people from finding out, 
um, you know, they were doing insider trading or whatever it is, they're almost always narcissists. And just, this is also a process question, but like, how do you balance for me, Sarah, um, long time listener, first time question asker. No, uh, how do you balance <laughs> the research and the writing? Like, do you do like to do all the research and then write, or is it like, as you're moving along, you're filling gaps, you're studying something. I think it's just entertainment. You know, I don't, I, I think I, yeah, I just like, I, you know, I would, I'd be like, what, what would, what would I enjoy learning about while I'm working on this? And then I almost always stumble on the thing I need to know, you know, as long as I leave myself open. So mm -hmm. I started, I found psychology in Seattle because of uh, the Stanford prison, ex you know, like mom mentality. And then I was like, oh, well, let me, I don't think I need to know anything about psychology for this. And then when I did, I was like, oh my God, this is a revelation. But I also feel like it's probably cultural, like the stuff that we're doing is so topical that it's kind of floating in the air. You just from any source, you can kind of pick it out and then be discerning and find the the more information. Um, OK, and uh, another question, what's your relation to your characters? Do they speak for you, write the story or do you have to figure them out on your own? Uh, you know, they, they speak to me and I feel like I have a relationship with them. Um, they're not people I imagine in real life or I, they're not people based on anyone. They're sort Except of like dirty, wild me, beauty queen. Yes, Utah. you're right. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Those high heels you're always in. High heels too. and gold eyeshadow. <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I write them and then I, I'll, I'll feel really close to them and I'll give them their background story because I'll always give people whatever backstory. And then I try and have them in their interactions with other people because it's really the only way you could show a character in my mind, um, do stuff. And then I'll come to some plot point and then I'll think back like, well, does this work? You know, do I need to change their character a little bit and tweak it so that this plot point works? Or do I want to keep this plot point or just get rid of it because I'm having too much fun with what's happening? And I think that's always, you know, it's it's the age old balance of plot or character because they they really they like to do this, and you just have to find ways that they don't. Mm -hmm. But you have that too. Oh, yeah, a absolutely. No, and it, it, it's is it all building to this or that? And yes, um, yeah. Well, any more questions, guys? You're running out of time. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> is there anything else you want to tell us, Sarah? Is there something we should know about good neighbors? Is there something I forgot or didn't ask you that you want to talk about? No, I, um, I think the only thing I have to say is that, um, you know, I did my best and I think, uh, <laughs> but I think um, I wanted to write a story that made sense of the last four years. And um, this is my, I, I, you know, I think, I think it was success, successful. So I think that's what it is. Yeah. But also, you know, uh, support indie bookstores. They really are struggling. And, uh, you know, hopefully Book Soup, if not Book Soup, if not Good Neighbors, support your local indie bookstore because um, they're the flavor of any place you live. Yeah. And I believe it was on Book Soup's Instagram today that I saw the fact that like Jeff Bezos could have paid every Amazon worker $100,000, some horrifying fact. So he could, he has the past like with his personal fortune. Wow. Um, yeah. I mean, like, yeah. Since the pandemic started. Yes. Sam is pitching in. Sam, do you want to jump on to say a, a lovely good evening or good night to everybody or? Sure. Yes. He is. <laughs> Look at that, guys. Internet, that's space. That's just yeah. <laughs> um yeah, this was all such a great conversation. Thank you both so much for joining us. And any aspiring writers, those are some amazingly helpful questions and answers. So thank you for contributing that. And yes, Sarah already gave the spiel on um, independent bookstores, so I don't have to, but it really is like she said, no matter where you live, um, to contribute to that ecosystem for sure. And I hope everyone enjoyed and thank you for taking the time out of your weekdays. And 
Everyone have a wonderful night. Thanks. Thank Bye you, guys. guys. Thank, thank you, Sarah. Oh, thank Sam. you, Sarah. <laughs> thank All the Sarahs in the chat. There's like eight of them. <laughs> Bye, guys. Good night. Bye, guys.